if you didn't catch the game last Sunday, uh, you didn't miss a lot of drama, certainly not who's going to win kind of drama. But one little bit of drama uh, that generated headlines for a couple of days after uh, Brady <clears throat> hoisted his seventh Lombardi trophy, it was the drama that took place between Tom Terrific and the Honey Badger. You remember? Tieran Matthew, who's always had a feisty disposition, even here in the valley, uh, but the Badger, as he likes to be called, was upset because he felt like too many penalties were being called against the Chiefs. But he picked a fight with Tom Brady and stuck his finger in Brady's face with the game still undecided. Dude, that's just not smart. His little move drew another flag, leading Matthew to whine. He was clearly chasing me, but I get flagged. You know, wah, wah. Now, it's not like Tom was an angel. One time he chased Matthew several yards just so he could flap his gums a little bit. And so back and forth and back and forth and back and forth they went the whole game. And even after the game, like a couple of kids, Matthew was claiming that Brady is the one who started it. And then he even tweeted something. Now, you know, that's dangerous. Brady called me something I won't repeat, but yeah, I'll let all the media throw me under the bus as if I did something or said something to him. A comment that led many to speculate that maybe Brady had said something racist. And boy, did that tweet get legs until somebody informed the Badger that Brady had been mic'd up for the whole game. Everybody knew everything he said the whole time. And so that's when the Badger quickly deleted the tweet and the story died. Why do I take your time with such silliness? It's not because a Badger tried to take down a goat even though that is a funny headline. It's because neither of these otherwise very strong men who could probably bench press three of me without even trying, yet neither of them could control that little two and a half ounce slab of muscle called the tongue. However, before you shake your head or point your finger or cluck your tongue at those two middle-aged men who should have controlled their tongues, maybe you ought to take a listen to what James has to say about how we handle our tongues. In James 3, verse 2, he says, We all stumble in many ways. How true is that? And anyone who is never at fault in what they say, well, he's perfect and therefore fully able to keep his whole body in check. And with that, James launches into the most comprehensive teaching on the tongue anywhere in all of Scripture. And we're going to break it down. He begins by making what is on its face a, a rather obvious observation. But he wants us to know first that the spoken word is powerful. Then he offers some pointers for how to properly use our tongues, not just a, a list of good words versus bad words. No, James's insight goes way deeper than just that. But then he closes with telling us, here's how you can heal your damaged tongue. So let's start at the beginning. The obvious, that we all stumble. So I mean, forget trying to keep your whole body in check. You trying to control that two and a half ounce of muscle called the tongue, that could just be the biggest challenge of them all. Because every single human who has ever walked God's green earth, we've all struggled with the tongue. Am I right? <laughs> really? We've all stumbled. I mean, just look around. There's some good people in this room. But all of us have tripped over our tongues. We've spoken words that we can never take back and we will forever regret. Because even though, verse 5, the tongue is a small part of the body, James says when we put something as small as a bit into the mouth of a horse, we can turn the whole animal. Isn't that something? Just a small little piece of rope or metal and you can make that horse go wherever you want it to go. And then he says, what about a, a ship? Although it is massive, again, a little tiny rudder, and the pilot can take that boat wherever he wants it to go. So also the tongue. It's a small part of your body, but it makes great boasts. Just consider, James says, how a great forest is set on fire 
by a small spark. And we know that. A little tiny thing, it can pack a punch. One out of control tongue can destroy a church. It can wreck a marriage. It can forever tarnish a reputation. It was an unruly tongue that killed the Savior. Your tongue, on its own, just a little slab of muscle, it is weak, and yet no other part of your body can disrupt your life quite like your tongue. Your hand can't lead your feet astray. Your ear can't force your nose into submission, but the tongue can lead every part of your body into damnation. Like a bit in the mouth or a rudder on a boat or a spark in the forest, your words can shape the destiny of many lives. And that's why he says, your tongue is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body, It corrupts the whole person and sets the whole course of his life on fire. And that's true whether that life is the one who hears those words or maybe you're the one who is speaking those words. And you don't have to be mic'd up at the Super Bowl for your words to pack a punch. No, wise King Solomon said it best when he said that reckless words They can pierce like a sword. And not just penetrate, a deceitful tongue can crush the spirit. In fact, that tiny little thing in your mouth, it has the power of life and death. It's so sharp and so cutting and so vicious. But the tongue's power isn't just measured by the one who hears its words. Solomon says that we can trap our own selves by our own tongues, with our own sinful talk. And again, the big point isn't, here's the list of bad words, and here are the good words. That's not it. He's taking us deeper than that. What he's telling us is, our words are living things. Your words either give life to someone, or it takes that life away. And not just from the person who hears your words, but for you, the one who speaks them. Now, that's an astonishing claim when you think about it, so let's think about it. Let's look first at the power that the tongue has over the hearer. Do you see verse 9? With the tongue, we can curse men. In other words, when you say words that are intended to hurt somebody, and there are all kind of subtle and creative ways we do that, But because your words have the power of life and death, your your words aren't just wishing evil on that guy. Your words are imparting evil on him. And it's because our reckless words, they penetrate. Remember the old rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me? I mean, what a load of crock is that? (laughs) And yet we say it, though we know better. How many of you remember when you were a kid, that one time, or maybe more than once, when reckless words were either spoken to you or about you, and you still haven't forgotten them, have you? In some cases, they have marked you, even for decades. Maybe the remark was about your body or your lack of intellect. It was the first day of my sixth grade year, and I was the new kid. Unfortunately, they sent me to the wrong classroom, and I was too shy to bring it up until almost noon. And so they paraded me into my correct classroom, and before I sat down, my teacher introduced me as her new, extremely bright and gifted young student. And then she said, Stephen, I really hope that instead of the rest of the bushel spoiling you, maybe you can be a good example for them. Do I need to tell you how that endeared me to the rest of my classmates? So I did. I dumbed it down. Way down. I didn't want to be branded, not to mention hated, as the brainiac in the class and the curve buster most likely to get his face bashed in at recess. 
So instead, I oper operated beneath my potential, and I kept that up until I was almost through college. When basketball season rolled around, I was still struggling with that boy wonder label, still didn't know where I fit. And even though I was a pretty good athlete, um, I decided not to try out for the team. Little did I know all the grief that that would cause. See, the other boys in the class knew from recess that Stevie kind of had game. So um, when I didn't try out, they got so upset, they started a rumor about me that it, it was because I didn't want to show my legs. My lily white and pasty legs. And all those years later, I don't know if you've noticed, that teasing still stings. And it's because words are living things. And so like a tiny spark with one word, we can set a whole life on fire. So here's how it really ought to go. Sticks and stones can only break my bones, but words can kill me. Because one man's evil and reckless words can penetrate another man's soul and even change the course of his life and curse his life. Wyatt, think maybe you're overstating it, Dad? Actually, I don't. If some of you were willing and we had the time, I could give you the mic and you could tell your own story of things that people said about you, words that pierced you, but they attached themselves to you. For some of us, in some dark and oppressive way, those words still control us. Maybe it was something your father said. Maybe it was a remark by your circle of friends. And, and because the words they spoke are living words, they're still with you. You can't shake them no matter what you do. For many of us, such words are full of deadly poison. And though you've tried to bury them like a toxic chemical, they just keep seeping, don't they? And seeping and seeping. Solomon had it right. Reckless words do pierce like a sword. But keep reading, because words can also heal. The tongue of the wise brings healing. Words are also powerful when they form sentences like sun, I love you, or honey, you're such a beautiful young lady, or babe, you're my dear Valentine, you're loyal, brave, and faithful. And the thing is, we need to hear those kind of words as much as we need to eat food. We never outgrow the need for an uplifting word. Why? Why do words hold such incredible power? Well, this is, this is where James takes us into even more deeply profound truth. So deep, I, I think all I can do is tell you what he's saying and then trust the Holy Spirit to plant it in your heart. In verse 9, James says, what makes our words so damaging and so terrible and so destructive when you and I speak these angry or abusive words, it's this. With the same instrument, the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and yet with that same slab of muscle, we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Now, why do you think he added that last phrase? Here's what I think. I think James is trying to tell us that one of the things that makes us most like God well, hang on to that for a second. This verse is one of the few places in the New Testament where the image of God is even discussed. Clearly, this is a throwback to creation when God created Adam and Eve. You remember the sequence. He began by making the natural world, and then he created the animal world. And then when he finally got around to making Adam and Eve, he said, let us make these two special people in our likeness. Theologians throughout the ages have tried to decipher what that phrase means. I mean, what does it mean to be made in the likeness of God? Well, James gives us just a peek here in verse 9, telling us that our likeness with God means that like God, we humans need words 
We're like God, not the animals, in that we need to hear words, and we also need to speak words. Now, that's important because some people will uh, say, you know, all that really matters, pal, is what you think about yourself. I mean, you don't need anybody else's approval. No, if you're doing what you believe you're supposed to do, that's really all that should matter. What's this, all this talk stuff? Well, there's a Greek word for that kind of thinking. Hog, wash, that's garbage. I mean, take me for example. I'm an author. I absolutely love putting words together so that they mean things. But in order to keep writing, I need to hear from time to time words from those who read my words. Are you with me? So when I write a sermon, and if nobody says, great sermon, Pastor, over time, if I don't hear that feedback, I can lose heart. Same thing if I post something online. I need to hear words, good, bad, or insulting. Just give me some words. It's the same thing with a musician. There is not a musician alive who can keep playing his instrument or using her voice if there just is never applause or an attaboy or, man, that was awesome, dude. It's not an ego thing. It's a human thing. It's a made-in-the-likeness-of-God thing. Because how else can I know who I am unless somebody else tells me? So we all do. We need to hear words. But our likeness with God also means that we need to speak words. We need to express our feelings and our convictions. And the best way we can do that is with words. When you enjoy a good movie, which happens occasionally, if it's good... I mean, you want to tell somebody about it, right? Same thing if it's bad. Same thing with a concert or a great book. When you really enjoy the beauty of something, your enjoyment isn't complete until you share that experience. Maybe you hear a great worship song on on the radio, so you track Eli down and go, man, you got to listen to this. Why do you do that? Because you hope that the other person will share the same experience you had. By the way, that's why solitary confinement is considered torture. Not physical torture, but torture. And it's because the need to talk and to be talked to is so fundamental to our existence that if you are denied that basic need long enough, you'll go bananas. Because we're made in God's likeness. And at least a part of that likeness means we must exchange words Almost as much as we need food and water, we need to hear words and we need to produce words because as humans, we have been made in the image of God. So to us, words are more than words. They have unlimited power. So if the words are good words, they nourish us. If they're bad words, they can poison us. Think of it like this. You were made in the likeness of God and God's first creative act was... He spoke, right? Let us make. And then throughout the ages, God kept speaking through prophets and judges and kings until that perfect moment when God started sending and he sent to us his son. But do you remember how John described the son that God sent? He said, in the beginning was the what? And the what? was with God and the what was God. He, the what? Oh, a little slow on that one. He was with God in the beginning. And then what happened? The Word became flesh. So because of that union, fellow human, watch what you say. That's the whole point James is driving at. Because your words have enormous power over those who hear them. So watch your words. You could destroy another person's self. So watch your words. Because with a different set of words, you could heal that same person's sick soul. Every student of child behavior will tell you kids crave compliments. They're like sponges. 
They need constant verbal affirmation. They just got to, got to, got to have it. Why? Because they're little humans made in the likeness of God. And that's why they have to have a word from outside themselves. Hopefully a word that sounds a little like, well done, good and faithful. Or maybe, you are my child whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And grown-up kids, we need those same words. In fact, we can't survive without them. We won't thrive as humans if we don't give such words as well as receive such words. About seven centuries ago, I was a youth pastor. And I was speaking at a regional youth conference one time, and one of the students there had this huge, deeply purple birthmark stretching across his face. And yet it just didn't seem to bother him. He was poised and confident with the adults. He interacted comfortably with the other students. He didn't seem troubled at all that there was this, this thing across his face. And so I, I came up and, and I just started chatting. I said, you are aware, right, that you've got like this birthmark on your face? He said, I do? <laughs> he said, no, of course I, I am. I said, well, can you explain to me why it doesn't bother you? He smiled and he said, yeah, when I was a little boy, my dad told me that my birthmark was there for two reasons. One, that an angel kissed me just before I was born. And two, the angel did that so that my dad could always find me when I was alone so I would never be lost. And he said, my dad told me that so many times. And he did it with such tender love that when I grew to be a teenager, I actually felt sorry for kids who hadn't been kissed by an angel. See, that's the power of your mighty tongue. A well-timed word can urge a, a, a tired runner to keep pushing for the finish line. A, a remark of wisdom can spark warmth in a heart that is turned cold. It can trigger self-examination in someone who on his own might never see his shortcomings. A, a, a well-timed word of wisdom can, can put salve on an inconsolable grief, put wings on a weary heart, and provide an oasis of encouragement to someone wandering in the desert of despair. But that same tongue can strike like shrapnel in someone's brain. It can convince a weary soul there's no use trying and tell a hurting sinner, eh, you'll never change. One careless word can stick in someone's heart and rob that soul of joy and take the better part of a lifetime to pull it out of your brain. Okay, so that's the power of words on the person who hears them. Let's talk now about the person who speaks them. Because James doesn't just say that words can curse and poison the other guy. He says, and the proverb we keep going back to also says, that words can curse and poison us. Check it out, verse 2. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's perfect, right? Anybody? Okay. But if his tongue starts spitting fire, verse 6 says, those fiery words can set the whole course of his life on fire. In other words, your own tongue can change the course of your life. That's just how powerful words are and why mastering your tongue is so vital. Your tongue can dictate the essence of who you are. How does that happen? Well, the first thing James says is your words reveal the real you. Look at the end of the passage. My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. You follow in the logic? The only way you can know what kind of water it is, is to taste. The only way you can know whether a root is a fig or otherwise, 
is if it bears figs. So if you really want to change who you are, you've got to first know who you are. And the best way you can discover and know yourself is take a long, hard look at the words you say. Because your words reveal you. Now understand, James wrote this centuries before the advent of what we consider modern psychology. And yet, the theorists of counseling even to this day will tell you, you got to get people talking and then get out of the way. Because the more someone talks, the more he will begin to understand his own issues. When someone talks in an unguarded way, a self-revealing kind of way, eventually they're going to go, who, did I just say that? I think I said that. Maybe could that be my problem? Hmm. What you believe is what will shape who you are. What you believe about God, what you believe about other people, your belief structure It determines who you are. But you won't know who you are unless you start listening to your own words. So if you aren't using words, and and if you don't have trustworthy people in your life where you can just kind of verbally belch all over them, if you don't have a safe place where you can work through your issues using words... And instead, if you're a loner, you don't ever talk about your feelings, especially not in public. You are guarded. You don't yammer on like other people. Yeah. And you may never truly know who you are. Because you can't know yourself just by thinking. It takes words. Your own words. Because not only do your words reveal your heart, They also direct your heart. And that's why we got to control our tongues. Maybe you're thinking, well, what good would that do? Well, we've already seen at least part of the answer in verse 3. How a bit in the mouth of a horse can turn the whole animal or a big ship steered by a small rudder. So also, James says, the tongue. You do remember that Jesus, during his ministry, he made it clear to us that your connection with Christ is measured by whatever is in your heart. And that's true whether it's good stuff down there or bad, righteous or evil. As one of God's creation, you were made in the image of God. Therefore, there is by nature a lot of really good stuff in your heart. If you're also a Christian, you've got the Holy Spirit and the grace of God at work in that same heart, but also deep down in all of us, there's a whole lot of sin and selfish and stupid desires there too. You've also got hidden in that heart of yours stuff that people have said both to you and about you. And not just you, all of us. We all have the words of predators and abusers that still swirl deep inside plus silly comments about pasty white legs and nerdy brains and other such nonsense. Jesus actually said, whatever comes out of your mouth, those words reveal the true condition of your heart. And James agrees, saying, if you want to direct your heart toward the good stuff and not just the cancerous, evil, and ugly stuff, if you want to grow more noble and righteous and squeeze out the dark and evil parts in your heart, here's how you do it. You watch your words. Now follow me. It's one thing to have evil, stupid, and destructive thoughts. That's bad enough. But when you clothe those evil, stupid, and destructive thoughts with actual words, you are granting authority to those thoughts whether you're shouting at the TV because of the latest nonsense coming out of D.C., or maybe you're directing those same kind of hostilities in the direction of your spouse, when you say such things, and if you keep saying those things, you are giving greater power to what once were just thoughts, 
But when you add words to those thoughts, you are infusing them with oxygen. You are granting them greater power. Same thing is true even if the words are about yourself. Because if in your self-talk you say, man, I'm just, I don't deserve to live. Nobody loves me. Nobody should love me. When, when you let loose with such cursings over your own life, you're putting dynamite to those thoughts within. And eventually, those words will explode on you. Now, it would be awesome if we didn't have those thoughts at all. But my point is, if you do have such thoughts, and all of us sometimes do, please don't add to the power of those thoughts by using words. And instead, use your words, James says, to make promises and even confession. Okay, let me explain what I mean by that. Over in James chapter 5, just two pages later, he urges us to make it a habit of getting together with other believers, primarily so that we can, do you see it? Confess our sins to each other and pray for each other. Now, the trouble is most of us read that, and especially post-COVID, we go, oh, Jimmy, I could never do that. You mean even if doing that is the pathway for how you can be healed? But see, we don't like talking about these kind of things. And do you know why? Because if we confess, if, if we speak of my need out loud so other people can hear it, it kind of makes us accountable, right? But if instead of just venting your anger, um, by saying either in yourself or to, to maybe your spouse, oh, I can't stand that jerk. If you instead speak to another believer or maybe a small group of believers and you say, man, I'm struggling with that cat and I just can't seem to dial back my emotions. When you do that, you're accountable, right? And those words... They reach back down into the righteous part of your heart where good promises get made and there's power. When you got married, you made all kinds of ridiculous promises, remember? <laughs> promises about faithfulness, promises about doing what is right and having a love that is pure. And what makes such promises so powerful is not only are you saying them, but you're using actual words. Plus, other people are hearing those words. But see, without words, without voicing our promises, without openly confessing our need, without being in accountable, uh, accountability relationships, for one thing, you may not truly understand who you are and what's happening in your life. But far worse, you won't become the person you say you want to be. What I find so interesting about this passage is James really only mentions two things specifically related to how we should properly use our tongue. And most of what he says has to do with two things, either boasting or cursing. <laughs> I came across across uh, an article while I was prepping for this message, and um, I think it might help us as we kind of think through the proper use of our tongues. The thesis of the article is what grabbed my attention. It, it said that even among those who claim to be Christians, even though we do believe in Christ, even though we will say that I've embraced the gospel, we don't actually function like we believe the gospel. See, the gospel teaches that the verdict on Steve Wyatt is already in, right? My father God has already said, Steve, I punished my son Jesus in your place. Therefore, you are now my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. And Steve, that ain't ever going to change, not forever. And that's the gospel. But most of us, somewhere down in our inner self, sometimes find that too incredible to believe. 
So instead of resting in the verdict that God has already made, we spend the rest of our lives scrambling and trying desperately to earn God's favor and to prove that I am worthy of his sonship. And so though we mouth all the right words and though we say that we believe that we're not condemned, we actually live as though it's my job to keep patching together my own personal quilt of righteousness. And we live out our days thinking, I got to defend myself. I got to prove to others, but mostly to myself, that I really am. I am God's forever child. But as I try to prove my worthiness, what do I typically do? Well, I either make excuses for why I do what I do, or, better yet, I point my finger at you, and I tear you down, or I gossip and criticize you. But what I'm doing is I'm dragging the gospel back into the courtroom, even though the verdict on me, it's already been handed down. So this article suggests that every believer should occasionally take what they call a tongue assessment. You ready for this? <laughs> The thesis is you won't realize that you're not operating in the gospel until you take an honest assessment of your tongue. And that's kind of what James is talking about. So here's the assessment they devised, and I just dare you to do this this week. They said, for the next week, just don't do these six things. Number one, don't complain or grumble. I know. Number two, don't boast about anything. Number three, don't gossip. Number four, don't run anybody else down, not even a tad. Number whatever, don't defend or excuse yourself, period. And then finally, always, 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 affirm, affirm, affirm the other guy. Sound hard? You can go online, go back to that. I I know you're going to want to commit to that. (laughs) But they recommend in the article that you do that because if you never acknowledge just how hard it is to control your tongue, you will never really see what's truly going on inside your heart. Because all six of those items have to do with what James is talking about here, either boasting or cursing. You're either trying to build yourself up by making excuses or painting yourself in a better light or by making the other guy look bad. And it's all because we're still operating as though we're still in the courtroom of the Father, even though the gospel says, get out of that courtroom. The verdict on you is already in. You don't have to defend yourself, and you certainly have no business prosecuting anybody else. Jesus was already condemned in your place, and you have already been fully accepted as one of his own. And if you and I would truly understand that, and if we would just rest in that, we wouldn't be doing all the gossiping and complaining and cursing and accusing that has so marked our world these last several months. Instead, we would be calm and restful, eager to learn and to listen, and when needed, to speak truth, but never, ever in anger. And to never, ever make myself appear better than you. Wouldn't it be awesome if we lived like that? And yet, because we, down deep inside, don't fully embrace the gospel, Most of us are boasting and cursing like drunken sailors. So how do we heal our ugly words? If words really are as powerful as James says, where do we go for healing? And that's what I so love about the passage because James puts it right out there. He says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And yet with it, we also also curse men who have been made in God's likeness. And he goes on to say, how can that even be? I mean, out of the same mouth? Really? How's that even possible? 
Now remember, he's writing to Christians. Christians who had been scattered because of their faith, and yet, man, they're in. But his point is, even you guys who are so serious about your faith, you got two actions at work in your life, and they are wholly incompatible. Maybe it's physically possible to do both, but we can't do both at the same time. So when we praise the Lord our Father, we're acknowledging what he did for us in Jesus. And so we praise him for doing that, and we rejoice in the cross, which is the polar opposite of what we've been doing a lot of lately in this COVID world of ours. We're cursing ourselves and each other. Now, James isn't saying that we ought to bless people instead of curse people. That's not his point. His point is, you need to be praising the Father. If controlling your tongue was just a matter of blessing people instead of cursing people, then his message to us wouldn't be any different than any self-help course you could take online. But James says in verse 8, no one can tame the tongue. So the answer isn't you trying harder. It really isn't take that tongue assessment and make it happen. The answer is praise your Father. That's it? That's it. Because you do not have what it takes to heal your broken tongue. But because of the gospel, you don't have to. You're not in the courtroom any longer. So the only testimony that is required from you is praise the Father. Remember on Palm Sunday when Jesus rode that colt into Jerusalem, how all the people were waving the branches and praising him? And remember how those stodgy old religious types were saying to Jesus, that's blasphemy. And they tried to get Jesus to stop the people from praising him. Remember what Jesus said? He said, boys, let me tell you something. If the people keep silent, the stones will cry out. So keep it coming, people. Give high praise to the Lord your Redeemer because this is the gospel. Jesus Christ is all the word we need. And the truth of who he is is the word we must forever speak. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my Redeemer. Those are the words that heal. So speak them. Give praise, high praise to the Lord, your Father, because you are his forever child, and there ain't nothing that's ever going to change that. This last year has been so filled with such ugliness. Words as ugly as I have ever heard. And we all own some of that, don't we? But the answer isn't more discipline. It's not Congress passing another law. It's not the internet finding another way to cancel people. The answer is the truth of who Jesus is. That's where you will find the power to heal your damaged tongue. And that alone is the truth that can take all the silly, gnarly, ugly, and abusive things that have ever been said about you or that you have said about another. The pathway to healing is you praising your Father. That's how you break the cycle. That's it, Wyatt. Dude, you don't know how much it that is. So let's make a start. What do you say? We may not change the world, but let's make a start. As we prepare for the meal of Jesus right now, I urge you, step out of the courtroom. Fill your mouth with praise for the Father who loves you. Would you bow with me? Oh, Father, we have all been so broken by the experiences of this 
last year. And perhaps it's no more obvious, no better demonstrated than what we have allowed to happen to our tongues. Father, give us a passion to stop cursing and to start praising. Stop cursing. Start praising. Stop cursing. And to start praising. We come to your meal where the battle was won. The story is forever told. Nothing ain't gonna change that. Never. And we are grateful, beyond grateful. Father, give us a heart that when we are tempted to step into cursing, that we will praise you instead. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.